so show of hands, quick show of hands, how many people think the power industry is going to change dramatically in the next 10 to 15 years? Pretty much the majority. But those that don't actually believe that, I don't blame you, because quite frankly, the industry hasn't changed dramatically in the last 100 plus years. So the way we, we make and deliver power really hasn't changed in that time frame, right? We, we, we make power in large, uh, efficient generation facilities. We, get, we, we leverage economies of scale, and we send that power over lo long distances over wires, often to consumers. And that served us well. That's a model that served us well. In fact, it's a foundation of our society. Without that, we wouldn't be where we are today. Electricity, cheap and ubiquitous electricity, is a cornerstone of modern society. So, um, so I, wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't blame, uh, blame you if you thought it wasn't going to change. But, but I'm going to argue that there is a lot of change in the wind. And it's, that change is, is symbolized by a company, a car company, that was named after an inventor that is largely responsible of where we are today. So one thing I'll, I'll tell you is going to change is that my granddaughter, who was born last fall, will probably never drive a vehicle powered by liquid hydrocarbons. And she'll probably live in a city with multiple transportation choices, including autonomous vehicles, with much cleaner air than we have in the, our cities today. And that all goes back to uh, all starts, of course. And that, uh, that, that ultimately is because of the electrification of everything. But it all starts well over 100 years ago with a gentleman by the name of Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was a genius. And we're here, we hear a lot about him today, maybe thanks to the car country, uh, company. But uh, he, he was a true genius. We think about him in terms of his, his contributions to, to the electric industry. But he did a lot more than that. He, he actually spoke eight languages. He, was, he created the foundations of the wireless communication industry that we know today. He held 300 patents. And he, he was a genius in, in, very, in, in all senses. He was very eccentric. And uh, he had a wild imagination. But let's, let's go back to where it all started. And it all started in a small village in what is now known as, as Croatia, called Smiljan. And uh, that village was part of actually the Austrian Empire back in 1856 when, when Nikola Tesla was born. And he was born to an Ether, Eastern Orthodox priest and a, uh, a mother with little formal education, but apparently with considerable intellect. And he, had, he was the fourth of five children. He had three sisters. He had a brother. His brother died in a horse riding accident when he was five years old. And by all accounts, he had a very tumultuous uh, upbringing, a tumultuous childhood. He was sick very often. In fact, he was, he was on death's bed at one point to the extent that his father said, if you'll, if you'll survive this, I won't make you, I won't try to force you to become an Eastern Orthodox priest, which is what his father wanted for him. So uh, when he grew up, and went to college. He went to the Technical University of Graz in, in Austria. And then from there, to study math and engineering. And from there, he went, to, um, he went to the University of Prague and studied some more there. It's not clear whether he actually got a degree, at least in my, my reading of it. But he went from there, and he, he, he got some practical experience in the, the telephony industry in, um, uh, in Austria. And then he was recommended to the Continental Edison Electric Company in Paris. He worked there for a little while, and then he was recommended to Thomas Edison himself in New York. So Tesla set off and immigrated to New York in 1884, and he went to work for Thomas Edison. Now, it's not, it's not clear, or there's, there's multiple accounts, let's just say that, of what happened there. But by Tesla's own account, he was promised things, including money, that were never delivered. So he struck out on his own. He formed his own lab, which got funded by, by investors. But because of who he was, 
an eccentric genius, one of the things he wasn't was, was practical. And so he always had money problems. So in 1888, he, he uh, sold all of his patents for AC power to George Westinghouse of the Westinghouse Electric Company in, uh, in Pittsburgh, PA. And that set off the famous current wars, DC versus AC. And we all know who won that. A couple of milestones in that time frame. The first one was that Westinghouse won the contract to supply electricity and, power and light to the, uh, the world's Columbian Exposition in, um, in Chicago, which was on the 400th anniversary of the landing of Christopher Columbus. And it was a huge success, uh, not financially for Westinghouse, but in terms of what they were able to demonstrate. And because of that, they got the contract to build the power station at Niagara Falls. And in 1896, they started supplying power to the city of Buffalo, New York. So if we think about it, we can draw a straight line from then, 1896 to today, and not much in many ways has changed in terms of the structure of the utility industry. But I'm going to argue that we're on the cusp of a major change right now, and that, that change is symbolized by a car company named for Nikola Tesla, the Tesla Motor Company. A fascinating fact, you think about all the, the, the major growth businesses today, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Ubers, the Airbnb, what do they share in common? They don't really have any assets. They don't produce anything physical. Tesla is an exception. Between 2008 and 2018, they grew from $18 million in revenue to $21.5 billion in revenue. Let me repeat that in a different way. In 10 short years, they increased their revenue by 1,100 times. Their market cap today is about 46 billion, slightly less than GM's of 56 billion, and more than Ford's at 38 billion. But they make far less vehicles than either of the two of them. I'll tell you a little anecdote that sort of illustrates just how powerful this, this, this growth has been. A friend of mine five or six years ago put a down payment on a Tesla vehicle. At the same time, he put a substantial amount of money in Tesla stock. And of course, the vehicle, as was the case back then, was back ordered. Six months later, he took delivery of the vehicle, and he literally paid for it with what he made on his Tesla stock. I, unfortunately, am not that smart because I'm still driving a gas-powered Toyota. Um, but anyway, it's not just about Tesla. So Tesla is the, is the poster child, the symbol of all this. But every single major car company in the world either has in production today or will have in production soon a battery electric or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And in 2017, we had 2 million battery electric vehicles on the road worldwide and one million plug-in hybrid vehicles on the road. China, in particular, is surging. Roughly half of, of electric vehicles on the road today are in China. But we have to be realistic. Less than 2% of all vehicles worldwide on the road are, are electric. Now, that's still significant. If you think about the growth in places like China, you know, how fast transportation is growing there, 2% globally is, is still significant. And there's only one country that has double-digit electric vehicles. Anybody know who that is? What country that is? Any guesses? Norway. They, they passed 10% recently. An astounding factoid, um, last year, 49% of all, electric, all vehicles sold in Norway were electric. 49%. Now, we've got to put that in perspective, because Norway is a small country. And in fact, my grandfather immigrated to Canada in the 1930s from Norway, and he used to always like to say, there are not many people there, right? There's more, there's more Norwegians outside of Norway than inside of Norway. I'm going to talk a few minutes about supply, uh, but not much, because you're going to hear a lot about that from everybody else. But we know, we know that 
that, that's changing. You're, you're going to hear about wind and solar a lot in this conference. You've heard about it a lot. lot. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about one of the issues there, which is, is storage. So an organization called Energy and Environmental Science, or a journal called by that name, which is a peer-reviewed scientific journal, did a study recently where they, they, they studied 36 years of weather data on a day-to-day -day basis across the country. And what they found is that if we wanted to get to 80% solar and wind, that we would, we would either need a high-speed transmission network that could balance power over hundreds of, of miles, or we would meet, need a, a massive storage infrastructure across the country, which would cost, in today's dollars, $2.5 trillion. So this is, this is substantial. I don't think we should get discouraged, though, because if we look at the past, if we just look back at the past 10 to 15 years, and if we look at the investments that are being made in storage by the consumer electronics industry, I think we're not going to see a linear line of improvement with storage. We're going to see step changes here and there. We can't predict it, but we can, we can uh, uh, imagine that that might happen. So if it, didn't, if it wasn't challenging enough for the industry to face these two really significant changes, again, the, the, some of the biggest changes that have happened in the industry in the last 100 years with demand and the demand side, the electrification of everything, and on the supply side, all the movement towards renewables, there's another force that's affecting this industry and every industry, and it's called digital transformation. So the, um, this is something that's affecting everyone. I mean, we know about it in our personal lives. So what we buy and how we buy it, how we're entertained, how we do our jobs is changing dramatically. I know, I know, you know for a fact, I don't think my children have ever stepped in a bank. They use credit, debit cards, and most importantly, Venmo. I, I, I'm pretty sure they don't buy much in stores either. In fact, my daughter buys my granddaughter's diapers online at Amazon, everything. She buys everything online. So that's, that's all changing. But let me put it in the perspective of something that's more relevant um, professionally and to, to, to our industries. So I began my career, um, I spent the first 15 years of my career as an engineer in the oil and gas industry. And I became an expert in process control systems. And uh, at one point, I found myself at Hess Oil Virgin Islands uh, Corporation Refinery in St. Croix. And Leon Hess, when he was alive, liked to uh, run his operation lean and clean. I'll tell you the clean part <laughs> over coffee at some point. But what the lean part means is that he had one expert for everything in his facilities. And I was the process control expert. And this is, by the way, was one of the world's largest refineries, and it sat on an island in the Caribbean. So it wasn't, wasn't like you could pick up the phone and call someone from down the road to help you out. So I sat at the back of the control room behind one-way glass, and anything happened in that refinery, I knew about it. And if anything happened with, that, that, uh, with the control system, I heard about it. In fact, there'd be head on a swivel looking back at the room where I was at. And I was on call all the time and, and, and whatever. It worked really well to a certain extent. Nothing went wrong. But if you think about it, for that, for me, it was maybe job security. For them, it was a single point of failure. What if I made the wrong decision? The consequences could have been dire. So let's flash forward 20 plus years. And let's say my granddaughter decides she wants to become an engineer. And I would certainly encourage her to do so. That job won't be available. Because the expertise that, that was in my head, and I do say was, uh, will now be in a machine. And the data that, we, that sits in, in control rooms and in places similar to that will be on a platform in the cloud. And to the extent that we rely on humans to make decisions, we'll rely on lots of humans. We will we'll have distributed decision making. What this means is that and this is a good thing, by the way. It's very disruptive, but it's a good thing. It means that ultimately our operations will, will, will get to the point of perfect predictability and perfect transparency. And ultimately, um, you know, that, that's a good thing. It means less uncertainty, less, less incidents. And uh, 
But, so what that means is that data and uh, the, the, the digitization, digitization of knowledge is, uh, is going to really transform how decisions are made and what we do. And this is well underway today. And if you really want to understand it in more detail, and this is just, it's not something that's just affecting our industry, it's affecting every industry. If you want to understand it in more detail, read a book called Machine Platform Crowd. Has it, has, how many people have heard of that book? Wow, so absolutely get it. It was written by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee from MIT, and they have done more to explain the impacts of digital transformation on the world than anybody. And, and, and if, you're, if, you, uh, if you're concerned about your future, your company's future, and your children's future, then read that book. So let me, let me end by coming back to where I started, which is my granddaughter. What will I tell her when she's growing up? Well, I'm going to tell her the same thing that I've told her mother and my, her, her siblings, which is the world is changing, and you have to be prepared to change with it. And I'll leave you with my favorite Tesla quote. And he said, the present is theirs. The future, which is what I work for, is mine. Thank you.